Welcome to the Texas High School Football Coaches Show on Lone Star Gridiron. I'm Chris Daly, and it's my belief that the men that make up the fraternity of Texas high school football coaches are much more than a bunch of thick neck guys with whistles. They do so much more than teach technique and the X's and O's of football. They take young boys and change them into young men of character. They get kids to believe in themselves, to trust others, and to put others ahead of themselves. Texas high school football coaches are unique in how they impact the lives of these athletes as well as the generations those kids touch. In this show, I sit down with a different Texas high school football coach each time and learn about them. Not their record, not their on-field accomplishments, but who they are and what they believe and what it means to be part of the greatest sport in the greatest state. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lone Star Gridiron Texas High School Football Coaches Show, Season 4, Episode 24. Yes, that's right. This is the final episode for the 2019 season. My guest this time is very special. It is Rusty Dowling, the head of the Texas High School Athletic Directors Association. I will introduce you to him right after this. Hey, I want to give a big thank you to this season's title sponsor, Mecca Sportswear, where they are all about celebrating achievement. They're honored that so many high schools, colleges, and universities have chosen Mecca's products to represent their institutions. Mecca supplies you with the very best in custom letter jackets, chenille letters, patches, blankets, banners, pins, certificates, and much more to motivate and celebrate achievement in athletics, academics, or the arts. They create high-quality custom awards that will fit your budget. To see why so many great schools around Texas choose Mecca Sportswear, call Sherry Armstrong or Billy Armstrong at 210-651-6592. Mecca Sportswear, the premier suppliers of letter jackets and awards for over 40 years. If you're looking for a quick and easy way to raise a bunch of money for your sports team, 99 Pledges is the best way for football teams and booster clubs to raise the most money with the least amount of effort. Donors can donate online. Each player gets their own donation page that they can share with their friends and family all over the country. Check them out at 99pledges.com. They are an excellent organization. You're going to be so glad that your next fundraiser is through these guys. All right, everybody join me in welcoming Rusty Dowling from the Texas High School Athletic Directors Association. Coach, how are you doing? Good morning, Chris. I'm doing well this morning, doing very well. I'm assuming that title coach never goes away, even though you're not actively coaching every minute right now. Yeah, I hope it never goes away. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I still see a lot of my former players and and so on, and they still refer to me as coach, and, and I like it, and uh, it means a lot to me. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, as you know, uh, in this, this show, we talk about coaches, we talk about history, philosophy, uh, all that good stuff. But, um, you know, I do want to talk about the Athletic Directors Association well as well. But first, let's go back to your history. When, when you first discovered athletics in general? Well, uh, that's really a good question. Um, <laughs> I always felt like I had coaching in me because even when I was growing up, and I was in junior high and maybe starting my first year or two of high school, mm-hmm. I always enjoyed coaching the younger kids on, on my, in our neighborhood area. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'd go up and we'd play baseball and we'd play football. And, you know, that was back at a time before all the video games and everything. And all the kids were always outside. Yeah. And so I was always organizing baseball games or basketball games or whatever. And so, you know, I'm, I might look at, you know, my time when I was growing up as a, as a youngster, 
is that's kind of when the coaching bug kind of got to me a little bit. So, uh, uh, and I, and I started, started doing all that. So I guess that's kind of where I would, you know, start with as far as my coaching goes. Nice. So, uh, Tell me about where you went to high school, where you went to college, what you played, things like that. Right. Well, I went to high school up in South Dakota. Uh, I was born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina, and my father was in the Navy. And then when he got out of the Navy, we ended up moving to South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that was quite a change. And uh, I uh, went to high school at Lincoln High School in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, played football there, played baseball there, and then went off to college and played football uh, at Morningside College, which at that time was an NCAA Division II school, and we were in the league with North Dakota State, South Dakota State, Northern Colorado, and so on. So it was a very competitive Division II league, at, you know, uh, at that time. Uh, since then, uh, Morningside has repositioned itself to an NAIA school. In fact, they just won the NAIA National Championship game uh, this past December. Um, so that was that was pretty profound for uh, for that for that school. Uh, after I left Morningside, um, I started my coaching. I I spent time as a graduate assistant coach at Northeast Missouri State University. Mm -hmm. where I was coaching offensive line, and then I went back to Morningside College uh, as the offensive line coach, a uh, place that I played at and graduated from. I went back there to coach and spent two years coaching there. Uh, after two years, um, one day our head football coach came in and told us, he said, well, he says, I've just taken a job at Kansas State University, and I will be leaving tomorrow. And so, you know, in the college game, uh, you start scrambling, you start looking for work. Mm -hmm. And so I interviewed for a couple college jobs and was real close to accepting a college job when a friend of mine from Omaha, Nebraska, called me. Uh, and I had known him through recruiting a guy by the name of David Lee. Mm -hmm. David called me up and he said, I understand you're looking for a job. And I said, well, I think I found one. I'm, I've interviewed for a college coaching job and, and I think I'm going to take it. And he said to me, he goes, well, he said, I just took a job in Texas down at a place called Mission. Mm -hmm. And he said, I would like for you to come down and be my offensive coordinator at Mission High School. And at the time, Chris, I had no desire to coach high school football. Right. I wanted to coach college and, and so on. And I said, well, David, I appreciate the call, but it's it's just not going to work. He said, well, think about it. I'm going to call you tomorrow and see if you change your mind. I said, well, that's <laughs> fine. You're wasting a phone call, but <laughs> go right ahead. So I, I'm literally packing suitcases thinking I'm going to be going to coach another college. And David calls me up and he says, this is what you'll teach. This is how much money you'll make. And this is what you will coach. And two days later, I was on an airplane in Omaha, Nebraska, flying down to Mission, Texas. Nice. And I went down there and have never looked back since. And it was a great move for me and my wife uh, at the time. And um, that's how I got to Texas, 1983. 1983. So that's the that's the short that's the Reader's Digest for sure. <laughs> well, okay. Now I want I want to expand on that. Take me step by step from Mission to today. Well, I coached at Mission from 1983 through the 1988 season. Uh, from eight in the 83, 84, 85 years, uh, I was an assistant coach. I was the offensive coordinator for David Lee. Uh, David unfortunately passed away in uh, 1987. Oh gosh, I'm taxing my memory. I believe 1987, uh, I think it was December, January of 87. And then I took over and became the head coach. I was the interim head coach, took over in 87 and 88. And we had some very unique success in mission because we were one of the very first schools in the state of Texas to actually 
run a spread offense and throw the ball 40, 50 times a game. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, at Mission one year, we had the Class 5A Player of the Year, a quarterback named Lupe Rodriguez. Nice. And uh, very successful throwing the ball. So then in 1989 and 90, I was the head football coach at John Jay High School in San Antonio. And uh, we took that offense over there to, to John Jay. I was there two years, and then the Texas City football AD head football job came open. Mm-hmm. And I I looked at that as a very attractive job. Uh, of course, Texas City's over by Galveston, so uh, I was there for ten years, uh, coaching at Texas City. I left Texas City, went up to McKinney for a total of four years. Two as the head football coach, and then my final two years as the district athletic director because we had we had McKinney High School, and then we had built McKinney North High School. And it was extremely difficult to be the head football coach and an athletic director for two 5A high schools. Right. So uh, the superintendent and I discussed what's the best thing to do. I decided, and I was ready to be in athletic administration. So I stepped into the role of an athletic director for McKinney for two years. And then KDISD came calling, and that obviously was very attractive to me. So I went to KDISD for seven and a half years as the mm-hmm. director of athletics for the district and, you know, oversaw a lot of growth and expansion and, and so on in Katy. And then uh, the Texas High School Athletic Directors Association approached me about being their first ever executive director. Uh, the association was getting bigger, and some of the demands on the association were increasing, and they felt like they needed somebody in a day-to-day management position for the Athletic Directors Association. Mm-hmm. So I accepted that position, and I've been doing that now, Chris, for going on to seven years. Wow. And, and so that that's my journey through Texas. Nice. Well, you know, what I see here. Mission, San Antonio, Texas City, Kennedy, McKinney, all these places are, are all so different. Um, it seems like that gives you a good understanding of situations faced by coaches and athletic directors around the state. That's a very good point, Chris, and that is very true. Um, I feel like, you know, I coached in the Valley, I coached in Central Texas, I coached on the Gulf Coast, and I coached up in North Texas. Mm-hmm. So the only place I haven't been is West Texas, and, and I guess you could say East Texas. Right. But but I felt like I had a very good handle on uh, what the cultures of those different areas of the state were and, and how football, in this case, is played in the Valley compared to how it's played in Houston or compared to how it's played in Dallas. And mm-hmm. uh, and there are, there are a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences as well. And I can recall... Being in the Rio Grande Valley and coaching a mission where uh, one one of the coaches uh, that I interacted with a lot starting in about 1985 was Hal Mummy. Oh, nice. And Hal was at Copper's Cove at the time. And we had gone to the valley, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to be successful in Mission, Texas. <laughs> at winning some football games uh, because our 83 year and our 84 year were not very good. And we knew we had to do something to step it up or find something, find our niche uh, as far as what we were going to do to move the football and also play good defense. Well, what we had come up with and and, and in my discussions with David Lee at the time was we're going to have to make a concerted effort to do something completely radical and something completely different. And at that time in the state of Texas, it was throwing the football Mm -hmm. all the time, like every down. And that's what we went to. And between Hal Mummy and I and um, our staff visiting and going to BYU and a couple other influences, we developed that spread passing game down at Mission that allowed a guy like Lupe Rodriguez to throw for over 4,000 yards in one year. In fact, that one year, 
he broke the national high school record for passing. Now, now you look at that and you go, okay, that's a good season of throwing the ball, but it's not the best. (laughs) But back then it was pretty, pretty doggone good. So, uh, and then when you come over to, you go to central Texas, come over to uh, Texas city where there was still an emphasis on run, running the ball and the eye formation and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there, there was, there's a different styles of play, you know, through my coaching career that I experienced in the Valley all the way up to, to Dallas. Nice, nice. So one of the things that uh, I noticed early on was that ADs most of the time are also the head football coach. Do you know what percentage of head football coaches are also ADs? I don't know. Uh, I am sure that I have the data to go in and look at that. Hmm. Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. But what I can tell you, though, Chris, is I see a lot of athletic directors and head football coaches that are joining the Athletic Directors Association. Mm -hmm. One of the things, and I can relate back to this when I was an athletic director and head football coach, is 90% of my time was spent – being a being a football coach, right, and that hasn't changed, and and nor should it. Uh, when you go in and you are named the athletic director and the head football coach, your you know your your uh, uh, dominant responsibility is going to be coaching football. Mm-hmm. But as you and I both know, that ten percent of being an athletic director can be some real critical stuff, particularly if it's UIL related. And you've got to be you. You've got to know what you're doing. And one of the things that I have noticed with our association is we have more AD head football coaches that are joining the association so that they can become familiar with what an athletic director does. It's not necessarily the job they enjoy, or it's not necessarily uh, uh, prominent in what they do, but they realize they need to have some experience in being an athletic administrator to be able to do to effectively do the job. Uh, but I would tell you that for the most part in uh, class 1A through 4A, most everybody is an AD head football coach in, right. in that particular district, in those single school districts, certainly. Yeah. And um, now I guess why don't we back up and say for people who – who just see that as a title, head coach and athletic director, um, that don't understand the AD part of those initials. Can can you explain what that is? How that's different? How being the uh, how being the AD head football coach is different? Well, just just the actual role that is the AD. What what do they have to do? Well, you know, uh, I, it depends on the district. For instance, if you're an athletic director in a big multi school district. For instance, let's say you're in Katy ISD or Garland ISD or Northside ISD mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be. Uh, you have responsibility for the professional development of your coaches. You also have a lot of compliance responsibilities regarding the UIL. You've got eligibility forms, previous athletic participation forms, waiver forms. And as the, the athletic administrator for the programs, you are responsible for that. Mm-hmm. And that is, that's tough duty. That's hard duty. It really is. And, and, uh, you know, you do, you, you, you sit behind a desk a lot of the times and that's not always pleasant and that's not always fun. But once you step o- over and become a big district athletic director, uh, those are things that you have, you have, you have to do. Mm-hmm. You've also got to interact with your central office, uh, administration, whether it's your chief operations officer, your chief academic officer, uh, you have to be able to bridge that, and you've got to be able to communicate with those folks. And then, two, when you're an athletic director in a big multi-school district, if you've got 8, 12, 14 high schools, the thing that you have is you have 8, 12, or 14 different communities as well mm-hmm. that you have to be able to make some decisions based on what's best for that particular school in that particular community. And that can be very, very challenging, too. That can be very, very tough. So the athletic director, you know, wears a has a lot of different responsibilities. It focuses on administrative functions, Mm -hmm. administrative leadership and things. 
Uh, but that also translates down into that smaller school AD head football coach. They have the same responsibilities, just not on the same massive level that maybe a multi-school athletic director does. So, so um, I know when I talk to coaches about all the work that goes into their job, it, it, it's kind of worth it because of those relationships with kids. And it seems like when you become an AD at a multi-school district, that's, that's the big benefit that's removed from it. So where's the upside in a job like that? That's a very very good point by you, Chris. That's exactly what happens is you, once you become an athletic director, particularly when you remove yourself from the coaching piece of it, because now you're an athletic director at a big school district, where you, the, the benefits you now provide are to those younger coaches coming in. Mm-hmm. In other words, you basically have replaced the student athlete with the coaches. And that's the one thing I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed working with coaches, younger coaches, trying to uh, bestow any knowledge and experience I had into situations that, that, that they might run into. Numerous times, numerous times during my career as an athletic direct, director, particularly McKinney and certainly in Katy, I had a lot of coaches, campus athletic coordinators, head football coaches, that might call me up and say, I've got a situation brewing here on campus. This is what's going on. You know, I'm seeking some counsel on this. Mm-hmm. What can you do to advise me on this? Or where do I need to go with this? Or what action should I or should I not take? And I got a great benefit out of trying to trying to work with coaches on those type of things. And, uh, you know, my experience allowed me to react spontaneously to certain things. Uh, but then, too, on the flip side, you know, what might work at one campus may not work at another campus. And so you had to you had to be able to filter through that as an athletic administrator. Uh, but you do you do, unfortunately, lose touch with student athletes. But what you gain is the ability to work with coaches who affect student athletes. Definitely. So, so it sounds like you're just basically serving a different group of people, and and your rewards are in seeing those coaches succeed and come back years later. You know, thanks for your help. That kind of stuff. You know, th- there was nothing better as an athletic administrator when I was an AD than a coach calling me back, or I saw a coach later and he said, "Coach, that piece of advice you gave me in handling that situation worked really well." I took I took a great deal of satisfaction in that. I didn't care if I got any credit for any of that. In fact, I preferred not to. But I was it was always so rewarding for me that if somehow, some way, I could provide a coach with some direction or a vision on a particular situation, whether it was uh, dealing with a student athlete, with a parent, with a with campus administrator, um, with a UIL issue or something. Uh, that I could be a benefit to them. So uh, that was, yeah, that, 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 was, that, was a, that was the upside to being an athletic director. Nice. So now let's talk about the association itself. It doesn't have as much recognition as, say, the coaches' association, but I see it, it growing. People are noticing a lot more. Talk about what this association does. We are the professional association for all athletic administrators in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that we do is, you know, we provide professional development for athletic administrators. Uh, We have instituted a certification program for athletic administrators. Now, it's not a requirement. It's a voluntary certification, uh, but it is a significant um, curriculum. We call it the Texas Athletic Administrators Certification Program. Uh, and that was put together by uh, a, a large group of retired athletic directors, current ADs, superintendents. We were assisted by the UIL staff and by the TAPS, private school uh, association or uh, 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 office as well. Uh, so it's a very solid, good professional development curriculum that we offer to athletic administrators. 
we put on the state convention uh, that is in Waco at the end of March. We conduct monthly region meetings throughout the state, uh, which is extremely important for athletic administrators because as an athletic director, you, you have to be aware of what's going on in the state, not only with the, you know, the state legislator, legislature, but with the UIL or with TAPS, what's going on that athletic administrators need to keep their, need to keep their finger on the pulse. So we coordinate, uh, all of those region meetings. And then we have a, you know, we recognize athletic administrators through our awards program. Uh, so those are some of the things that we do. Our membership right now is we are about 1,130 members. Mm -hmm. Uh, the day I took over, Chris, we were 237. Nice. And now, yeah, now we're at, now we're, uh, I think we're probably the largest AD association, uh, in the country right now. And, uh, certainly have one of the largest conventions in the nice. country. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I enjoy it. I, I went, uh, last couple of years, I definitely had a good time. Um, if, um, if a coach is thinking, yeah, that's, that's more my style of, of, uh, for a career, what should they be doing to position themselves to become an athletic director? One of the things I tell coaches is the first thing you need to do, it's like anything else, you need to get into the network of athletic directors mm -hmm. uh, because going to interview for a job as a coach and going to interview for a job as an athletic director are two entirely different things. And and, and I, I, I have the opportunity to be involved with school districts and they're looking to interview an AD uh, and, because it's, it's such a different position. And so I see the difference between doing an interview for a head football coach and doing an interview for, for an AD. The thing that we try to provide through our certification program is we, we give those coaches a base knowledge of what it is that, or what are the duties of an athletic administrator what are the expectations of an athletic administrator? So going through our, what we call our TAC program, mm -hmm. uh, they're exposed to that directly from other athletic directors and school superintendents. We're also in the middle of starting a, uh, a program for aspiring athletic directors where we're going to take what we offer in our certification program and break it down just a little bit more mm -hmm. that is specifically uh, aimed at those coaches that want to be in ADs, it's kind of like a crash course on here's what you need to do if you want to become an athletic administrator in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that, that we're doing. But I always encourage anybody that has their eye on being an athletic administrator, you need to come to the conference and you need to get enrolled in our certification program, and that will answer a lot of your questions right there. And, and how long does that certification program take? It's a two-year program. Mm -hmm. There's 28 hours of courses that are involved in it, and it can be it can be done it can be done in two years. So once you get certified, uh, once you have that certification, you you of course are certified. But then there's a couple classes you need to take over a three-year period just to keep that certification active. You'll always have it, but to keep it active you need to have some continuing education that we also provide athletic administrators. Nice, nice. You know, the other thing that I would probably offer up to you mm -hmm. from an athletic director standpoint is, you know, the things change. A lot of things change. We have a lot of female athletic administrators. Yep. S strong number of female athletic administrators. In fact, <clears throat> I, I like to tell people, a couple of years ago, when Kay High School and Cedar Hill High School played in the football state championship game, both those athletic directors were women. Right. And both of those are terrific athletic directors. And at one point in time, a couple of years ago, that women were the athletic directors in some of the bigger school districts around the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was, and it was, it was significant. 
Um, the other thing that you see, particularly in the larger school districts, the criteria to be an athletic administrator has changed tremendously. It used to be, and, and, and I am a product of it, it, it used to be where if you were a good football coach and you won a whole bunch of games, you could go be the athletic director. Right. That's not the case anymore, not even remotely the case anymore. Uh, we have athletic administrators, a lot of them throughout the state, that have never been football coaches. Mm -hmm. I think we have some of them that have never played the game of football. So that is not anymore a prerequisite to being an athletic director in the state of Texas. Now, obviously, to be an AD and football coach, certainly. Yeah. But the multi-school athletic administrators, their, their professional resumes, there's many, many of those folks that uh, have never coached football before. So that whole dynamic has changed tremendously within the last, I'd say, five to seven years. Nice, nice. And so if, if there's somebody who's interested in pursuing this, learning more about it, joining the organization, uh, how do they reach out and find you guys? Well, of course, we have our website that they can get to that has a lot of good information on it. Um, but as I said, the biggest thing that they can do, and it's like any other profession, the key is to be able to network, uh, develop, you know, a, a network of athletic directors, go to the, go to our convention, go to the region meetings. That's the one thing that is extremely beneficial with our association is we don't have just a, a state conference and that's it, like a lot of other organizations. We have region meetings once a month. So in Houston and Dallas and San Antonio and the Valley and El Paso, those athletic directors get together once a month so that they can stay on top of important issues that they need for football, volleyball, baseball, softball, track and field, swimming and diving, eligibility concerns. Those are things athletic directors always need to be aware of. And what we do, we encourage uh, the athletic director, head football coach, or even the coach. You don't have to be a member of our association mm -hmm. to attend these region meetings. And they're extremely beneficial to a, an aspiring AD because that's a great learning process because you can be exposed to all of those issues and all of those things that athletic administrators have to deal with. Many times the UIL comes and does presentations at these. And so it's, there's a tremendous benefit there. So if you're out in El Paso and of course, Austin, Texas is not an easy drive. Yeah. Uh, the UIL, uh, will always go out to El Paso to attend one or two of their region meetings out there. So we always encourage them. You, again, you don't have to be a member. You don't even have to be an AD, but it's a great place to go to start the process. I love it. I love it. Yep. Coach Rusty Dowling, man, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me and sharing some more information about this association. Well, I appreciate it, Chris. Uh, thank you for your interest and in, in, uh, letting us uh, be able to, to tell your audience about what we do and, and our association, and um, I just appreciate that opportunity. All right, thanks. Hey, did you know that Lone Star Gridiron does mini helmets? Yeah, custom designed mini helmets that match your school. When quality and attention to detail are important, choose authentic Lone Star Gridiron mini helmets. Our library currently has hundreds of different Texas high school football teams. If you don't see your helmet, reach out to us about creating one. And hey, they make the coolest fundraisers for your booster clubs. Go to LoneStarGridiron.com and look for mini helmets on the top menu bar. This show is brought to you by the book, All I Need to Know I Learned from My Texas High School Football Coach, a handbook of wisdom for parents, young people, and yes, even coaches. Head over to www.learnedfromcoach.com and order your copy to support sharing the stories of these great coaches and leaders. That's learnedfromcoach.com. Hey, once again, I want to thank Coach Rusty Dowling for sitting down and talking with me a little bit about him, his career, and the Texas High School Athletic Directors Association. There are so many head coaches 
who are also athletic directors in this state. I thought it was a great way to send out the 2019 season uh, and, and get ready for the 2019 football season. Hey, and don't forget, support these sponsors. They are the reason I am able to bring the show to you each and every time during the off season. And speaking of that, yes, the show will be back. We have title sponsor Mecca back again for next season. And um, really looking forward to it. Coaches, if you want to be on the show, reach out to me. Or if you know a coach that I absolutely need to talk with, reach out to me. I will be reaching out to you guys during the season and recording some of these ahead of time so that when the off season does come, I'm not so swamped. Once again, thank you so much for listening, and hey, we'll see you at the game.